Hello everyone and welcome to today's Cambridge English Teacher Hangout by our expert consultant Professor Mike McCarthy. We're going to be answering all the questions or as many of the questions as we can fit in on the English Grammar Profile. So we've got a lot of questions so without further ado we'll start with a question from Virginia Riso who asks how can we make grammar a more interesting issue in class? Well, first, let me say good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world, to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to having a, a discussion with you on these matters. Well, it's a good question to start with. How do I make grammar more interesting? This suggests to me, and my own experience bears it out, that a lot of students indeed find grammar to be boring, tedious, challenging, etc. Uh, but there's no reason why it should be any more boring than any other aspect of language teaching. I believe the boredom, the tedium, the feeling that grammar is hard work, comes from the idea that grammar is an abstract set of rules which you must follow. Well, it is a set of rules, but it's a set of rules that exist in order to create meanings. Grammar has meaning and we use it in situations in our daily lives, interact with other people to create meanings of various kinds, to talk about the present and the past, to talk about what we might do and what we should do and what we did do, to tell people where things are in the world, in, at, on, un, etc. Uh, to talk about the way we see things ourselves. Now all of these suggest to me that the worst way to teach grammar is in a series of sentences that have no relation to the world of our learners. So I think the simplest answer is always teach grammar in context, whether it be in dialogues or in uh, written text, whether they come from books or newspapers, uh, recordings from the radio or TV or conversations, always teach in context and always choose those contexts which are relevant for your students. I don't know your students, only you know. But once you've done that and presented the grammar in contexts that are useful and meaningful for your students, always, always, always try to construct activities or to find course books which have activities that enable the learners to personalize that grammar that enable the learners to say or write something about themselves and their own life. Nothing helps you learn and remember something better than being able to use it about your life and your world, yourself, your friends, your family, your activities, your situation, your job. So personalizing is terribly, terribly important. So much of grammar teaching is just sentences that are hanging in the middle of nowhere. Sentences that you have to fight and struggle with and then you get them right or wrong. So there is much more to grammar than constructing good sentences. Start to think about things like how can I use grammar to be more friendly or the opposite, how can I use grammar to be more formal in for example a job interview or an examination. These are the ways to make grammar come alive. And there are good materials. Cambridge University Press has very good materials that bring grammar to life in this way and that enable learners to personalize grammar so that they can say things and write things about themselves and their work. Okay, thank you. Got another question now about um, replicating research which has been carried out in a very different learning environment or a different culture. For instance, um, you know, uh, if you're teaching in South America and um, you're trying to, to replicate um, uh, research that has been done in, uh, in say, Asia, I mean, do you have any suggestions on, on you know, how you can achieve that and get around the limitations? Yes. Well, let me answer that question, which is a terribly important and good question. Let me answer it in the context of what I'm talking about today, which is the English profile and in particular the English grammar profile. Now, the way the English profile project is structured is that we collect data, learners speaking and learners writing, 
from all around the world. We have data from 200 countries and, and all the different languages that are represented in those countries. Now this can give us two ways of working. The primary way that we use our data is to say, okay, wherever you are in the world, whether you're in Korea or Ecuador, whether you are in China or Brazil, whether you are in South Africa or Norway, whether you are in Egypt or Russia, what you might want to know as a teacher is how do my students shape up, how do they relate to students all around the world? This, was, this is one of the main uh, and most useful things that the English Profile provides teachers with. That is a kind of benchmark against which you can measure your students in your context against an overall world standard which is related to the common European framework of reference. Now that's one way of doing it. But at the same time, the way we have organized the data, we have metadata. We have a database about every student that has contributed data to our corpus, our English profile um, corpora. Metadata enables us then to group students, if we wish, according to language families. So we can take a look only at those students who come from Latin language backgrounds or Germanic language backgrounds or um, Chinese language backgrounds or Slavic language backgrounds. By being able to separate off the uh, data into these language families or nationality families if we prefer or we could do it by gender, or we could do it by age, we are able to make comparisons from a research point of view. But at the same time, we are able to create materials directed at regional um, markets. So Cambridge, again, um, Cambridge creates good material targeted at the Americas, at Latin America and at North America. And we do this by having the corpus resources very carefully databased so that we're not just looking at everybody all the time as one big population, but we can actually, and we do when we create materials, we do look at in particular the needs and learning habits and styles and language use of, for example, um, East Asian students. And I, I, I know this myself, I've talked extensively in Korea, in Japan, in China. And at the same time, I've also done a lot of work in Latin America. And I know how different these cultures can be. So although when you visit the English profile, you get a global picture, you can be confident that the researchers and the materials writers who are working with that project are also able to and are targeting and directing and comparing different cultures as they're represented in our team. That's a very, very good question. Okay, thank you. A question now from Sharon Hartle, who says she notices that the structure of the English ground profile is vertical with the examples of the simple past. Are you able to tell us a little more, please, about how, how that, was, that, was, that was done and how far the research is based on the learner, Cambridge Learner Corpus? Is? Um, when you say vertical, um, I'm not sure what you mean. Could you just clarify what that means? Okay, so Sharon, if, you're, um, if you could comment in the, in the, um, the Q&A, if you had another question, just with a little more, more detail on that, please, that would be very helpful. And um, I just need to move to turn the light back on in this room. <laughs> but the second part of the question was um, the dependence um, on the how much of the research was based on the Cambridge Learner Corpus and how much on, on other sources. Yeah. OK, well, I can certainly answer the second part of that question, that most of the English profile, the grammar profile and the vocabulary profile, the overwhelming majority of every element of it comes from learner data. We did also look at um, some native speaker data 
uh, but this was more or less for internal comparisons to, to satisfy ourselves that the structures that we were researching, the structures that, um, that were presented were in fact uh, grammar and vocabulary that is in use. Um, so, th so that was only used as a benchmark, but all the evidence for development and change across the levels comes from the Myrna corpus, which is a massive corpus of 55 million words of uh, Myrna uh, production. Um, so that's the answer to that part of the question. I don't know whether we have any further clarification on this idea of um, vertical um, not at the moment, but hopefully we can we can come if back. If we do, to that. we can come back to that. I'm sorry, that's my uh, inadequacy rather than oh. yours. I'm sure. I think it's, it's more likely to be mine. Um, so, a question from Marinella um, and us and Ursa, who asks: um, How do we gain access to uh, the English grammar profile, and can we use it to do classroom research? Okay, it's very easy. Just Google English grammar. I think it's, it's going to be as simple as that. If you go into Google, and I'll do it now to demonstrate it to myself, English grammar profile, if I put that in, the very first result that comes up on my Google screen is the English grammar profile. Now I can go straight to it, and there it is, the introductory screen, the home screen, and all the information you need about what it is and how to use it. And of course you can use it, it's a free resource. You can use it um, in whatever way you like, except you, you, you don't have permission to use it for commercial gain and producing commercial products. So they're, they're, the rules are there on the home page of the English Grammar Profile, which will tell you what restrictions there are on its use. But I'm very pleased to hear that you think you might be able to use it um, for classroom research. As I mentioned earlier, it's a very good global benchmark um, which describes how learners use grammar. It doesn't prescribe, it doesn't say this is the grammar your learners must use. It simply says this is the grammar that learners use all over the world at A1, B2, B1, etc. What you, I think, will find it's useful for is to be able to benchmark your students, to give you some idea of how your students relate to all these other hundreds of thousands of students around the world. Okay, thanks. We, um, Sharon's got back to us. Oh. Um, and the, the level thing was related to the explanation on the site, and the, uh, the idea being that at a lower level, you can use one aspect of a tense, mm. and at higher levels, you might use it as part of a conditional, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, this, uh, well, thank you, Sharon, for that clarification. Um, one of the interesting key concepts behind the English profile, uh, the English grammar profile, and here I must also acknowledge the fact that uh, I'm not personally responsible for the English grammar profile. I'm one of a panel of advisors. The research was actually done by Dr. Anne O'Keefe of the University of Limerick in Ireland, and Geraldine Mark, a researcher based um, who teaches in a college in England. And when um, Anne and Geraldine were doing the research for the project, they were faced with a traditional view of grammar. That's what they started with. You know, that grammar is something, yes, you do the present simple um, at, at level one then later you do the past simple, and then at the second level of your course you might do the past continuous, and at the third level you might do the past perfect, etc., etc. When you actually look at learners and how they use the grammar, what you find is something slightly different from the way it's progressively dealt out like food in the, in the course books and grammar books. What you find is that learners learn a small part of something the first time it's presented. For example, the first time you learn the present simple, you're probably learning it about things that happen regularly in the present, what time you get up, um, when you have your dinner, what you do every day or every week or every summer. 
But of course, that's only one function of the present simple tense. Um, another function, which I'm sure you don't learn uh, at the elementary level, is to dramatize a storytelling, to move, to suddenly change from the past into the present, to make the story more exciting. So what Anne O'Keefe and Geraldine Mark came to as a conclusion, as the best way to use the data they had, was to think of the notion of grammatical polysemy. Now, polysemy is a term which we normally associate with vocabulary. A polysemous word is a word that has many meanings. And as we know, most words in English have several meanings. Apart from scientific and technical words, most words in the English language are polysemous. But here's the thing, so is the grammar. It turns out that every grammatical structure is also polysemous. A symbol doesn't have one meaning, it has perhaps half a dozen or ten meanings. And it is deciding and observing when those meanings emerge in the learner's usage that is a very important thing. The implications for teaching are that you're always coming back to things. It's cyclical. Although the examples, as you rightly say, Sharon, the examples are presented in the English profile in a vertical manner, the actual um, approach and method by which these are learned are almost certainly cyclical. At least we hope they are. Good course books will revisit the grammar to add new meanings. So if we take a simple example like the English imperative, um, which is used to issue commands, uh, uh, do not park here, please arrive on time. That's the, the meaning that we all learn when we first learn the imperative. But of course the imperative is also used as a condition. So if I say to you, go into any shop in Cambridge and you will find clothes which are made in China. Now if I say that, go into any shop in Cambridge and you will find clothes and goods that are made in China, what I'm saying is if you go into a shop. So I can use the imperative to create conditions and this is something that happens quite a lot in uh, writing, in persuasive writing especially. So it's an example of grammatical listening and it's a, in the English grammar profile we represent this by saying any structure that you learn at a lower level you assume is still there at the higher level. It doesn't go away. So if I learn the imperative for commands at A2 it's still there when I'm at B2 or C1 but at B2 and C1 I might also now add um, the imperative used for conditions. But the way it's presented is indeed in a vertical manner. Thank you very much for your question, Sharon. Now, I'm sorry I didn't quite get the gist first time around, but that's my fault. Okay, thanks. We've got a question now from Ram Kakad um, asking about the student samples for the grammar profile, mm. whether they were collected as written samples or spoken samples. Right, when the uh, English profile project first began, we had overwhelmingly mostly written uh, corpora. And that was the Cambridge examination papers, hundreds of thousands of them which have been connected over the years. Now, it's important to understand that collection of spoken data is a relatively recent thing in the learner context. There are not that many good learner spoken corpora available. But in the last uh, five or seven years, the English profile has collected a lot of uh, learner spoken data. We now have just over three million words of uh, spoken learner data in the English profile spoken corpus. Now, that is obviously far less than the 55 million words of the main uh, written corpus. Um, but the researchers had access to both and um, obviously were able to look at both. But we have to be uh, very honest with uh, users of the English profile that we will constantly revise the profile as we get more and more spoken data. 
And although 3 million words uh, doesn't sound much in comparison with 55 million words, compared with spoken corpora, 3 million words is actually quite a large corpus. And it's very, very informative and it's providing really interesting insights. And I should add that the English Profile does have a separate project on spoken language. Research is being done and one day I hope I'll be sitting here presenting the English speaking profile as well as the English vocabulary profile and the English grammar profile because we do feel that speaking is one of the areas that needs the most research and that will provide the most interesting, new, innovative and original insights. Okay, I very much hope we'll, we'll have you back to, to talk about English speaking profile at some point in the future. So do I. <laughs> Excellent. We've got a question now from Romy Bazala Kutera, who asks whether it would be a good idea to give our students the complete grammar profile at their level in one go, or work with it little by little, making them sort of check, check topics. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say little by little. You know, it, it is a massive um, and rather daunting resource, even for teachers and researchers when you first approach it. I, th I think the way to do it is to make it as, as a small part of your general approach to grammar. Certainly make them aware of its existence, explain how it works and what it's there for. But I think if you just uh, say, look, the whole thing is there, just use it, they probably will need a, a bit of training. It's very interesting that research that has been done into what data-driven learning, that is when you enable learners to access corpus and corpus data directly. Uh, all the research that I've seen suggests that students do need a very particular kind of training before you can let them loose on that. You know, your students don't come to school or to college in the expectation that they will look at corpora or do online searches on the English vocabulary profile or whatever. And so I think you need to actually train them in how the resource works, how they can take advantage of that resource, not least to explain to them that it is a descriptive resource, not a prescriptive resource. Uh, if they see it as a prescriptive resource, they will probably feel so depressed and so demotivated and think, I can never possibly learn all that stuff. Whereas if we say, this is a descriptive resource. If you want to see how other students have used this particular phrase or idiom, or you want to see how other students get along with the uh, past continuous, then go to that bit. That would be my feeling. I don't know your students, but that, it seems to me, would be the most motivating and useful way of approaching what is a very, very uh, large and uh, comprehensive resource. Thank you. A um, question now from Sylvie Vesla, who asks whether you'd include grammar in, in language activities, um, your reception and production skills, or would you recommend doing that uh, separately? Yes, I mean, I think this goes back to what I was saying earlier, that I always feel it's a bit of a mistake to give students the impression that grammar is a set of abstract rules that, that doesn't really have much to do with um, communication or relationships between speakers or relationships between the writer and the reader. The more you can build in the use of grammar to your speaking and writing activities, the more your students, I, I, I hope, will see that grammar is just as much a communicative tool as any other aspect of the language that they use. So. For example, um, if, if I take my earlier example of storytelling, everybody likes to tell stories. It's, it's a very nice activity to do with students once they have a certain amount of vocabulary. But stories have a grammar. They have a very typical grammatical patterns that occur. Um, even in, in writing news stories, for example, if you pick up a newspaper or go to a news website, uh, in English, you will often see a pattern whereby the exciting headline, the piece of news that they want to catch your eye with, is in the present, is in the, uh, present tense. Uh, Prime Minister resigns. 
in the present. Then when you start the article, you often find the present perfect. A prime minister has announced that he or she is going to resign. Then the details come in the past tense. Um, he or she said yesterday that that they felt that it was now time to step down and blah, 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 blah. So you have that distinct pattern of grammar and it has an important communicative function. So yes, build it into your speaking and writing activities. I think it's, it's a big mistake to say, well, that was the grammar lesson. Now tomorrow we're going to have a lesson on speaking, listening skills. And somehow the students don't see any relationship between those two uh, aspects of learning language. Thank you. Um, question now from Zanina Sharieva, who works at a private company offering English classes and has been told not to teach grammar and writing at all and to focus entirely on listening and speaking. Do you think it's possible to teach students to speak in a proper way without going through grammar? Um, no, I don't, because <laughs> if you think of what it is that enables us to speak, to communicate, then it is a simultaneous, it's almost like an orchestra. It's, it's an, a harmony of grammar, vocabulary, and phonology, the sounds, the, the pronunciation, the intonation, and so on. And I know where this view comes from. And in some ways, it's a common sense view, and that is that yeah, I think it was um, way back in the 1970s that I think it may have been David Wilkins who said, um, with a lot, with a, a lot of vocabulary and little grammar, you can communicate. With a lot of grammar and only little vocabulary, you can't communicate. Now, of course, there is a certain amount of truth in that. So, I certainly do believe that building a big vocabulary is terribly important. I've said this in previous webinars and, and, uh, on these sessions, that the sooner you can build a vocabulary of about a thousand words, the more you are able immediately to start communicating. But those thousand words do need the grammar. Even if they don't need the whole grammar, they need the most basic grammar in order to make sense. So, <laughs> so you know, something like um, Mary uh, spoke to the police officer doesn't mean the same as the police officer spoke to Mary. It, it has quite a different meaning. Um, and so it doesn't matter how many words you know, if you can't put them in the right place and create the right kinds of meaning about time and space and who does what and where and when and how, then of course you won't be able to communicate at all. Now, your question, I think you said you work in a... a uh, private, private company offering private English. Private company, yes, offering English. So I imagine that your target would be business English. Now let me tell you something. I spent quite a long time studying the grammar of business English. And there are some very interesting features, uh, especially in speaking, that business people use when they use grammar. A simple example, in our uh, Cambridge corpus of spoken business English, we find that the verb must, in saying, you know, you must do this, you must do that, is far, far less frequent than it is in general English. Mm. And the reason is, of course, that if you keep telling people what they must do in business, they probably resent you and feel that you're being too bossy and too powerful. What we find instead is the verb need is massively more frequent in business English than it is in general English. And bosses generally say, you must do this and we must send this to, to America. They say, we need to do this, we need to send this to America. But their employees interpret that to mean you must do this. So when the boss says, we need to get this to our colleagues in New York by this evening, the employees don't say, oh, do we? Oh, that's interesting. What they do is they actually understand and that means do it. So there is a grammar to business English and I'm not here to advertise, but if you want to pursue that matter further, have a look at Cambridge University Press's course, Grammar for Business, which is corpus-based. It's based on business, real business English, 
and it focuses on the grammar that you need to understand how business people talk and write and to use that kind of grammar yourself to be successful in business, in negotiating, in selling, in networking and all the things that business people do. So far from saying that grammar is not important, I say that in business English it's actually even more important because business English grammar has its own special ways of using the grammar. Okay, thank you. And, and Selena, we hope that that helps you. Um, now, we're going to carry on for a little longer than usual today because we've got so many questions. So we're going to carry on for an, another 15 minutes and to try to fill in as many questions as possible, I'll, I'll go straight on. Um, we had a few questions about um, the difference between productive and receptive skills and the fact that the vocabulary profile and grammar po profile are both based on productive skills. Are there plans to build something relating to receptive skills and what learners yeah. understand at different levels? Yeah, this, this is a question that, that often comes up. And we haven't done that yet, so it is important to note, yes, that the uh, English grammar profile and the English profile are based mostly on what students are able to um, produce. But, of course, we do have access to all the Cambridge examination papers uh, which test people's uh, comprehension and, and so on. So I think it would be a good project. Sadly, we can't do everything on all at once, but it would be a very good project indeed in future to see what the differences are between, especially in the case of vocabulary, the um, vocabulary that students use and their vocabulary science. Now, having said that, that, that it hasn't happened in the English Profile Project, of course there has been a lot of research done on uh, learners' vocabulary science, the, the, the typical sizes of learners' vocabulary most notably by Paul Mira and his colleagues at the University of Swansea in the UK, by Norbert and his colleagues at the University of Nottingham in the UK. And um, this research is, is available in the journals and online and so on. And there are ways in which we can measure, reliably and accurately measure, um, learners' vocabulary size, their passive, receptive understanding of vocabulary. So it should be possible then to relate that to what they actually use in the examinations, which evidence we already have in the English vocabulary profile. So it is possible and we can do it. We haven't done it yet. Probably because nobody has given us the money to do it. But hopefully one day they will. Okay, thanks. A question now from Sarah Nadele who um, asks about the role of L1 in teaching grammar. Yeah, well, I personally, um, I am a great believer in using L1 where you can. Now, I think the reason why we moved away from uh, using L1, when I started teaching many, many years ago, uh, it was considered quite respectable and quite okay to use the learners L1 in the class. My first teaching job was in Spain. I had a knowledge of Spanish and I found it very useful to help learners to see the differences between Spanish and English grammar by making comparisons. That went out to fashion partly because of the rise of uh, multilingual classes in places like Britain and North America and Australia and those dominant countries which then uh, of course, the publishers followed also by producing materials which catered for people from a variety of first language backgrounds. This was for economic reasons and practical reasons. If you want to produce a very large language course, it costs a huge amount of investment and money. Publishers like Cambridge University Press, uh, they do this. And you cannot possibly have one for every a version for every single language around the world. So for that reason, we've tended to think that the best way to teach a language is only by using the target language, the L2. But I think in the case of grammar, there is a, a lot of positive uh, evidence to suggest that helping learners to understand how their own grammar works is a very, very good thing. People are not very good at knowing their own grammar. British people 
American people and Australian people don't really know much about English grammar. They think they do. All they know is what they were taught at school, but that's usually something completely crazy and wrong. Um, and that's why we use corpora, because corpora enable us to see how our own grammar works. So don't be afraid to use, uh, to refer to the grammar of your student's first language. If you know it, and if it helps them and you to see what the bridges are that they have to cross. I mean, I lived in Sweden for five years, and really, you know, grammar wasn't terribly difficult because it's not that different from English. However, I also learned Welsh when I was in school as a boy because I was born and brought up in Wales, and the grammar of the Welsh language was really a very difficult puzzle for me. And it would have helped if I had at that time had someone helping me to see how it related to English grammar. So yes, bring back the L1 where you can, where it's uh, useful. Don't use it all the time, certainly not. But when it's useful, don't be afraid to use it. Okay, thank you. A question now from Sal Rakhmetova who asks about how we can teach grammar in a way that students will remember the rules and, and avoid repeating the same mistakes. Quite a, quite a fundamental question, but I wonder if you have any... Yeah, I think there are several answers to this. And uh, again, this brings us back to the English grammar profile research. One of the things which emerges from the data, from the corpora in the English profile project, from the learner corpora, is of course that mistakes become possible. Uh, the classic example is the use of uncountable nouns, which is a tricky part of the English grammar. And it seems that no matter how many times we teach words like information and furniture and um, research and various other words, various other uncountable words, even at B2 and C1 level, students still make the same mistakes. So clearly <clears throat> there are ways around this. The first way around it is of course constantly to revisit these issues. If you learned countability and uncountability in level one, you haven't finished it. You have to keep coming back to it. But what we found in our own research in producing materials for, for Cambridge um, when we were producing the touchstone and viewpoint um, courses, is that advanced level students don't like to feel they're doing the same old stuff that they did before. So in the case of accountability, what we did, and it seems to have worked, is we revisit the notion of accountability, but use new nouns that perhaps they haven't um, used before or learned before. So at the very highest level, you, you will be working with uncountable nouns which are appropriate to the um, B2 or C1 level or whatever it is you, you, you're teaching. Then you can, once you have done the new nouns and help them better to understand again the notion of accountability, then that's the time to remind them that they should look back at the nouns they already use and do an activity whereby you can give them a list of nouns and say, now, looking back, do you know which ones of these were, uh, uh, are used in the same way as these new words that you've just learned? That was a technique that we used in the materials we produced. Always present something new. Revision will be boring if you're repeating exactly the same material. Excellent, thank you. Um, question now from Christina Rebuffe who asks, um, do you, can you make any suggestions um, for getting students to be able to identify and learn chunks by themselves? Well, I can speak from my own personal experience here. When I went to live in Sweden, I had a very good teacher who um, instinctively knew that the best way we could learn to speak Swedish was to learn some very useful, common, everyday chunks. And I remember this teacher saying to us, um, chunks are just little pieces of music. When you're sitting on the train or the bus, or when you're just sitting in your room, you often sing a little song in your head, inside your head, privately. 
it's, it's a kind of private music. Do the same with the chunks. Think of them as little pieces of music. Sing them in your head a hundred times. That's one way to do it. But another thing I would like to mention is that Cambridge English teacher, um, CET, Cambridge English teacher, has on its uh, YouTube channel some very nice um, short videos explaining uh, idiomatic chunks, uh, some, of, some of the most common idioms uh, that are in everyday use. And right now we are producing more videos with Cambridge English teacher based on the most common everyday uh, lexical grammatical chunks that are used in conversation. These are going through the process of being videoed and they will be online on the YouTube channel of Cambridge English Teacher. So that's a resource that you can point your learners at and they can do that at home privately or when they're sitting on the bus with their phone in their hands and have a, a, a bit of fun at the same time. They're good fun with the YouTube videos. Great, thanks. And they'll be on the same YouTube channel that um, the recording of, of this Hangout will be on as well. So you'll, you'll be able to find that there as well. Okay, um, one final question now, um, I think, which will be um, your suggestions, Mike, um, if you have any for teaching uh, the grammar profile for with respect to young learners. Any particular thoughts on that? Um, I think I'm going to disappoint you here and say that I have no experience teaching young learners, but if I can, if I can presume and imagine what it must be like to teach um, younger learners, then in some ways I would say, I would repeat what I said at the beginning of this, this hangout, and that is that the best way to teach grammar, whoever you are teaching it to, whether young or, or middle-aged or any group at all, is to teach it in contexts that make it understandable and relevant to them. Now, again, I don't want to advertise, but the, the Cambridge uh, course, Kids Box, does this. Um, it, it, it's a wonderful course for young learners. And for instance, it has songs in there, very simple little songs, which teach the present continuous form, for example. And I, I'm not going to sing them to you now, but I've heard some of them and I think they're excellent. And um, I, I think this is, I think Michael Tomlinson is one of the authors of that course, but you'll find it on the Cambridge website. Uh, it's called Kids Box. And it's a very good example of how you can take grammar out of that abstract rule-based domain and bring it into something that every child likes doing, which is singing and moving. It's done with a lot of total physical response. You know, I'm standing, I'm sitting, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And you're singing it at the same time and you're absorbing the, the present continuum. But I can't claim to be an expert on that field, as I say, this is something that uh, you'll find on the Cambridge University Press uh, website, Kids Box, I recommend. And ra rather beautifully, um, that segues in wonderfully to the webinar that we'll be running on Cambridge English Teacher on Wednesday, which is, uh, which is Urs Kalbera will be talking about using songs in the classroom and yeah, songs for there language we are. learning. There we are. Yeah. So that's, Sorry that's I'm not an expert on young learners. I'm always asked about young learners, but I'm an old foggy myself and I've always taught adults. <laughs> I'm not, not on Fergie at all, Mike. <laughs> okay, so that's, I'm afraid, all we've got time for, but um, I hope I'm you've really enjoyed... I'm really sorry I haven't had more time to answer your questions. Your questions have been so good, I could have spoken for a whole hour just on one of them. So I'm sorry to those of you who didn't get your questions answered. But thank you so much, everyone, for asking questions, and we'll be back in a month's time with, with another Google Hangout with uh, Professor McCarthy. Uh, so thanks to everyone for the questions, thanks for everyone who's been listening, and thanks particularly to you, to you, Mike, for another thank excellent you. session. And goodbye to everybody, and thank you for attending. Thank you, Alastair, for your next Thank bye. you. Bye, everybody.